All right, we are recording. So as I said, there is a lot of information today on the stomach. And uh, there's a lot of information that isn't in your textbook. So I'm glad you guys are here today. If you want to refer to this video later on, I think that's a good idea. Uh, let's start off where we left off. Uh, okay, so this is the lower esophageal sphincter. I want to make sure that you guys know the difference. This is a two pathophysiological states. One's called achalasia, and the other one is esophagitis. And they're both conditions where the LES, or the lower esophageal sphincter, fail to function normally. Okay? So with achalasia, this is where the LAS... I'm sorry, the LES fails to relax. And what usually happens is food starts to accumulate right here in the esophagus, which can be very painful. It can actually uh, cause distension and pain. And my uncle actually had ac achalasia. He had food accumulating in the bottom of the esophagus here. It couldn't actually enter into the stomach. And again, he actually had to go to the hospital and get tubed to force that food into the stomach, which is very painful in itself, uncomfortable. Okay, so achalasia is a, a situation where the LES fails to relax. Esophagitis is a condition where the LA, LES fails to maintain tone. So it's actually too relaxed all the time. Usually there's a basal tone associated with it. With esophagitis, it relaxes when it shouldn't, and acid from the stomach actually enters into the esophagus, which can really degrade the epithelial cells, destroy the epithelial cells that line the esophagus. And if it happens over and over and over again, it can actually lead to esophageal cancer. So if you have chronic heartburn, when you get older, really young people don't tend to have as much heartburn as people more my age. If you let it go unchecked, a lot of times it can lead to cancer. So might as well get some medication. Uh, usually the medication, and I'm going to talk about that today when we talk about the proton pump, the proton potassium pump. Uh, it is uh, medications that actually inhibit that pump in the parietal cells in the stomach. So we'll talk more about that in just a second. Uh, esophagitis, itis actually is any kind of condition that causes inflammation. So esophagitis is when you have a lot of inflammation in the esophagus. And again, this can lead to development of ulcers in the lower esophagus. Okay, so let's move on to the new material. We're going to start with the stomach today. First of all, I want you to know these major landmarks. Again, this is uh, one of those figures that is fair game for uh, an exam. So do know how to label the major parts of the stomach. You can actually see here is the esophagus. And here's the LES, or the lower esophageal sphincter. Some people have called this the cardiac sphincter as well. The top of the stomach here, the very top is called the fundus. And then you see the body of the stomach. We'll be talking about different cell types within the body, the parietal cells and the chief cells. So I have a slide with those two different cell types in just a second. But those cells secrete pepsinogen, and the parietal cells secrete acid. And then there are other types of mucus secreting cells that we'll talk about in a little bit too. But the body usually has these different functions, cells that secrete mucus, pepsinogen, and acid. The antrum is the lower part of the stomach, also secretes pepsinogen. Now, in this area, close to the pyloric junction, are cells that are called G cells. G cells. Those are in the antrum, close to the pyloric junction. And these G cells, just a capital G, G cells secrete gastrin. 
It's a hormone that enhances acid secretion. And then here's the pyloric sphincter. Technically, this isn't a true sphincter, so I call it a pyloric junction. But you may see it as pyloric sphincter. And that's the entrance to the duodenum. That's the, the upper part of the small intestines. Some people pronounce it duodenum. I actually pronounce it duodenum. Some people pronounce it duodenum. So either way is just fine. Okay, so there are specialized cells in the stomach that synthesize and secrete mucus, enzyme precursors like pepsinogen, and hydrochloric acid, literally hydrochloric acid. Other cells like G cells secrete hormones. And then we're going to talk about the motility, too. The, there's abundant, smooth muscle cells in the stomach that are responsible for gastric motility. So if you actually see the name gastric, it's actually referring to the stomach. Okay? All right. So let's kind of talk about some of the mechanisms. Uh, in this case, it is referring to motility. There's something called receptive relaxation that I want to start off with. Receptive relaxation. I think this is interesting. This figure doesn't really encompass everything that's going on here. But you actually have sensors that will detect food in the pharynx, that's the back of your throat, and in the esophagus. You can't really see it here, but there are sensors, mechanoreceptors, also in the esophagus that send a signal all the way, these are long reflexes, all the way to the central nervous system by these vagal afferents. You should really pronounce it afferents, but I say afferents, so you guys know that it starts with an A. And these send a signal to the central nervous system. Neurons, nerves that actually send a signal away from the central nervous system back to the stomach are called vagal efferents or efferents. They start with an E. Okay. The vagal nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So this is your resting and digesting, right? This is the parasympathetic nervous system. So what it does is it detects the stretch in the pharynx and the esophagus, sends a signal to the central nervous system, and then back by these vagal efferents, and that causes a distension or a relaxation of the fundus. Receptive relaxation. It's kind of interesting. What it's doing is it's allowing the fundus to relax so that it can accommodate more food coming into the stomach. It's kind of an anticipatory relaxation. It's relaxing so that it can accommodate more food. It's anticipating more food and it's going to relax. Then there's another term, it's not on the slide, but in addition to receptive relaxation is what's called adaptive relaxation. And it's the same kind of idea. These are stretch receptors. This funny little symbol right here, it's also mechanoreceptors that are actually detecting the stretch in the fundus. These are the first bolus of food that enters into the stomach. It causes some stretch and then there's an additional relaxation of the fundus. Again, in anticipation of more food entering into that area. And you don't need to know the mechanism. It's thought to involve potassium permeability. It increases the potassium movement across the epithelial cells which hyperpolarize Actually, I should say the potassium movement across the cellular membranes to hyperpolarize the cell and actually cause a decrease in muscle tone, the relaxation. 
Some people have hypothesized that it involves VIP, which is called vasoactive intestinal peptide, or ATP. Again, you don't need to know the mechanism. I just want you to generally know what receptive and adaptive relaxation are. Any questions so far, you guys? Pretty good? Okay. All right, in addition to that mechanism, uh, I want you guys to know in general what uh, peristalsis looks like in the stomach. We talked about peristalsis in the esophagus last time. You guys remember the sweatpants example? When you're stringing the sweatpants and you, you, know, you pinch the back of the knot and you move the fabric along, it's a coordination between circular smooth muscle that pinches the back of the bolus of food and the uh, movement of longitudinal muscle, that would be the fabric of the sweatpants, to move the food down the line into the stomach. While peristalsis also occurs here in the stomach, there is something in the body of the stomach. These are specialized cells called the pacemaker zone. And they actually are expressing the same channel that the heart does. Remember the SA node has its own pacemakers? You'd also have those HCN channels in this, in this area as well. They spontaneously depolarize and cause a wave of peristalsis down towards the pyloric junction. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. The stomach can actually be a really violent place after you eat a meal. There is uh, movement, these smooth muscle cells that cause, and longitudinal smooth muscle cells, that cause the stomach to shorten Okay, so this whole area from the fundus to the antrum shortens. Then there's circular muscle that actually causes the stomach to constrict around the middle. And then there's these oblique muscles that actually cause the stomach to twist. Okay, so initially when you have food in your stomach, there's a lot of mechanical digestion that are going on. It's actually causing the food to be mixed along with the hydrochloric acid. Okay, and then you can see this is what's called retropulsion. That food is bounced down towards the pyloric junction. The pyloric junction actually constricts and forces the food back up into the body, from the antrum into the body. So it is like, like I said, really violent. Retropulsion, peristalsis, uh, oblique muscles are twisting the stomach. A lot of mechanical digestion are going on. All right, with that, I'm just going to talk about quickly what happens with vomiting. <laughs> On Wednesday, we are going to have an active learning exercise. We're going to take a look at a patient that um, suffers from alcoholism and all of the different organs that are affected with alcoholism, uh, vomiting in the stomach, um, what happens with the esophagus and heartburn, how the gallbladder, the liver, uh, lots of different organs are affected, and there's going to be lots of different symptoms as this uh, disease progresses. So um, it actually is a nice kind of overview of the entire GI tract and pathophysiological states. Okay, so kind of interesting. Part of that case study involves vomiting. Uh, I took this right from Wikipedia, you guys, uh, how vomiting works. It's actually called, the scientific name is called emesis. Emesis is just a super fancy name for vomiting. And so if you actually take any kind of medication that's an anti-emetic, that is some kind of medication that helps you to prevent vomiting or nausea. Okay, now, just so you guys know, vomiting and regurgitation are different. A lot of people use these two terms interchangeably, and I can tell you they're actually very, very different. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Let's go through the steps with vomiting. Uh, 
With vomiting, it's actually mediated through a vomiting center, an emesis center in the brain. So if you uh, eat something that is somewhat poisonous, uh, it will actually trigger the vomiting center. And what usually happens, the first step is actually retching. So this is where you kind of dry heave in some ways. You guys know what that means. Retching starts first. And then what happens is you start to inspire against a closed glottis. Okay, so remember that epiglottis moves over the top of the uh, esophagus, or I'm sorry, the windpipe, right, as you're eating. So imagine that. Try to breathe in against a closed glottis, just real quick here, right? If you go, oh, right? <laughs> Isn't that the weirdest feeling? But if you, if you try to breathe in against a closed glottis, it actually causes a negative pressure in the esophagus, in the upper esophagus, a negative pressure. You know what I mean? If you try it at home, if you're too embarrassed to try it now, I'm obviously not. <laughs> uh, you can inspire against that closed glottis and you can almost feel the negative pressure that occurs right in the upper esophagus. Then your stomach muscles actually tighten up, right? Your stomach muscles tighten up and it creates a high pressure in your stomach. Now, remember Ohm's Law. The food is going to be propelled from high pressure to low pressure, okay? And as soon as the pressure builds in your stomach, and then all of a sudden your lower and upper esophage uh, esophageal sphincters open, food is propelled out of your body into the environment, <laughs> hopefully the toilet, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so it's really about pressure differences, Pressure differences. All right. Regurgitation is completely different. Some animals, like birds, you know, regurgitate their food to feed it to their young. Regurgitation simply is reverse peristalsis. Okay, so we know peristalsis going down the esophagus. Regurgitation is just reverse peristalsis. It doesn't really have anything to do with that pressure gradient with vomiting. Okay, so they are very, very different. All right, again, kind of giving you an idea of all of the different, the motility, the pressure differences, what happens mechanically with vomiting. Okay, so let's go back now that you know a little bit about vomiting next week or next Wednesday. This Wednesday, sorry. We're going to be talking about diarrhea. So really fun stuff <laughs> associated with GI. Um, okay, let's go back to the stomach. I want to actually go through the different cell types that line the stomach. Now you need to kind of zoom in on the cellular parts of the stomach. The surface of the stomach is actually composed of columnar epithelial cells. These are cells that are fairly tall when you're looking at them compared to squamous cells, which are very flat and square epithelial cells, cuboidal. Columnar are a lot taller. So there's different types of columnar epithelial cells and they're all connected with each other by tight junctions, which really prevents the movement of any kind of electrolytes in between cells. Now, there are what's called mucous neck cells. Let's actually, let's take a look at the different layers of the stomach first. So if we're looking at the wall of the stomach, you can actually see that here is the uppermost uh, layer that's closest to the lumen, the inside of the stomach. And you have these deep, gastric pits that are lined with these different epithelial cell types. Right underneath that is the submucosal and the different muscle layers, muscularis, circular muscle and longitudinal muscle. 
So if we're looking at the top layer, the mucosa, you can actually see the mucous neck cells. Those produce mucins. That's the protein that makes up mucus. The parietal cells, the parietal cells secrete acid, literally hydrochloric acid. <coughs> And then the chief cells, they secrete a precursor to a protea protease called pepsin. It's actually a molecule called pepsinogen. Oops, if we go back to this one, pepsinogen is the precursor. So those are secreted by the chief cells, <coughs> pepsinogen. And then enteroendocrine cells, like the G cells that I talked about, secrete hormones into the blood. So this is the slide that is out of your textbook. Pretty much says the same thing. It's just taking a closer look at those gastric pits, the mucous neck cells, chief cells are in pink, and the parietal cells are in orange here. Chief cells secrete the precursor pepsinogen. Parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid. So they do interact with each other. Let's just take a look at that. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen, the precursor. Parietal cells secrete acid. And it's the acid, the decrease in pH, that actually converts pepsinogen to pepsin. And pepsin is an enzyme that starts, already starts to break down proteins to smaller peptides in the stomach. So again, the acidity in the gastric lumen converts the protease precursor pepsinogen to pepsin. And that starts to break down protein into smaller peptides. Okay, so one other thing, parietal cells, they also secrete something called intrinsic factor. I wanna make sure that everybody understands this. This is a good test question, actually. Parietal cells secrete intrinsic factor, and this molecule is actually essential for life. What it does is it helps your body to absorb B12, B12 vitamin. And B12 is actually very important in forming red blood cells. So what happens if there's a deficiency of intrinsic factor or B12? It can actually lead to something called pernicious anemia, pernicious anemia. You can just remember it as anemia, but remember anemia is when you don't have a whole lot of red blood cells or a lack of hemoglobin causes people to be very tired and fatigued. Okay, so intrinsic factor is also secreted by the parietal cells along with acid, hydrochloric acid. Okay, how are we doing? Any questions so far? Everybody's following along pretty well? All right, so let's kind of get to the heart of those parietal cells. Now we're, okay, so now we're gonna zoom in on this parietal cell. All right, we're zooming in on this parietal cell. Boom. This right-hand side is the inside of your stomach. So this would be the apical membrane of these epithelial cells. On the left-hand side, this is the basolateral membrane of those epithelial cells that faces the blood supply. All right, you guys have seen this reaction a thousand times. This also applies to parietal cells in the stomach. Carbon dioxide and water, 
is converted to carbonic acid by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Like I said, you've seen this already with red blood cells, right? We've seen it in the kidney, in the collecting duct. All right, carbonic acid is then converted, <laughs> broken down into bicarbonate and protons. All right, just like in the kidney, for every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted into the stomach. Remember, it's secreting hydrochloric acid. And one bicarbonate ion is actually transported to the, across the basal lateral side, into the blood by the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. Just like in red blood cells, right? Remember the chloride shift, the hamburger effect? We just learned about that. Okay, so every carbon dioxide molecule, one bicarbonate ion is delivered into the blood. One proton is delivered into the stomach lumen. Now, this is the pump that transports protons into the stomach lumen. It uses ATP, so this is a primary active transporter uses ATP to transport protons against its concentration gradient. Now, it also uses potassium. This is a proton potassium pump. And this potassium channel helps to ensure that the pump is, stays active. So you could also block this potassium channel if you wanted to reduce acid secretion. Most of the acid reduction medication, you guys probably may have seen it in Walgreens, like the purple pill, Nexium, right? There's a lot of omeprazole is the actual scientific name. All of those medications, they inhibit this pump right here, the proton potassium pump. Omeprazole is the medication. All right, now with most of the protons actually being secreted, actually being transported, I should say, into the stomach lumen, chloride follows the proton movement, and like I said, you're literally secreting hydrochloric acid after you eat a meal. All right, after you eat a meal, you're also transporting all of this bicarbonate into the blood. This is called the alkaline tide. After you eat a meal, you're actually delivering all of this buffer into your capillaries as well, into the blood. It's called the alkaline tide. So now you can see after you vomit, after you eat a meal, and you get rid of all those protons that you just delivered into your stomach, and you just delivered all this new bicarbonate into the blood, you can see how you could become profoundly alkalotic, a metabolic alkalosis as a result of vomiting after you eat a meal. Okay, so acid production by the parietal cells in the stomach depends on the generation of carbonic acid. And there's subsequent movement of hydrogen ions into the gastric lumen, which results from primary active transporters, the proton potassium pump. All right, you guys are doing great. Let me know if you have any questions. Let's talk about the regulation of the parietal cells. How are these regulated? Turns out they're regulated by hormones, paracrine signaling molecules like histamine, and neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. There's only one hormone that actually inhibits the parietal cells, and that's somatostatin. 
You'll notice, especially when we get to the endocrinology section, that somatostatin seems to inhibit, inhibit everything. So whenever you see somatostatin, you can automatically think it just is an inhibitory molecule. It just seems to inhibit everything. Yeah. Oh, statins. Statins are a little bit different. Statins actually help to lower cholesterol as well. Endostatins. This is a little different. Somatostatin. Yep. Okay, so one inhibitory and three stimulatory signals <coughs> alter acid secretion by the parietal cells in the stomach. So here I'm just introducing it. You can actually see how it stimulates it is it actually inserts more of those primary active transporters, the proton potassium ATPase. You can see it's just kind of sitting right underneath the plasma membrane, and when it stimulates it, it actually inserts more of these pumps to enhance acid secretion. Okay, so let's, this, uh, this isn't in your textbook, and this looks very unassuming, but there is a lot to this slide. So I'm gonna walk you through the whole thing. I'm gonna talk about the difference between the cephalic phase and the gastric phase and how this all kind of falls into place. The cephalic phase is what happens when you just smell food and you're anticipating eating, but you haven't swallowed anything yet. You're already starting to salivate, right? Your stomach starts to rumble. Acid actually starts to already be secreted. The gastric phase is when you now have food in your stomach and you get more acid secretion. You start to get breakdown of proteins and uh, mechanical digestion. Acid is starting to degrade it. That's called the gastric phase. All right. So I'm going to start to talk about what happens in the cephalic phase. Okay, here you're just smelling food. You're just like hungry and you start to think about eating food. In this case, you can see the vagus nerve, right? You actually have neurons, long reflexes and short reflexes that are already starting to stimulate and release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that actually uh, stimulates a G-protein coupled receptor. Anybody, can you remember which one it is with an increase in calcium? GQ, good memory, nice job. So this acetylcholine actually binds to a GQ coupled receptor which increases calcium. Also, you're starting to get those G cells in the stomach. They're starting, right? Gastrin is released into the blood supply. These are like capillaries. So think about this as the capillaries that surround the stomach. The gastrin actually feeds back to the parietal cells. Gastrin also is a GQ coupled receptor. So you start, this is a different receptor, but you start to get even more calcium release. With the two of these on board, acetylcholine and gastrin, you're getting a certain amount of hydrochloric acid that's being secreted by the parietal cells. So these both stimulate a certain amount of hydrochloric acid. Now you can also see that acetylcholine and gastrin also play a role in these nearby cells, very near the parietal cells, called ECL cells. These are called enterochromaffin-like cells. Enterochromaffin-like cells. Let me see if I have that written down. Enterochromaffin-like cells. Nope. Okay, so enterochromaffin-like cells. E-N-T-R-O, enterochromaffin, C-H-R-O-M-A-F-F-I-N, -F 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 like cells. 
dash-like cells. Enterochromaffin-like cells. So ECL is enterochromaffin-like cells. Okay, so what happens is now the gastric phase. You're getting more acetylcholine release, more gastrin release. It's really starting to ramp up, ramp up. Then it eventually triggers those ECL cells to start to secrete histamine. Now you have the trifecta. Call it the trifecta. ACH, acetylcholine is on board. Lots of gastrin is on board. And histamine is now on board. You guys recognize this G protein coupled receptor? Increase in cyclic AMP. GS. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> GS. So you get an increase in cyclic AMP now, too. Now you have the trifecta. This is the maximum amount of hydrochloric acid that can be secreted by the parietal cells. This actually causes something called potentiation, like the word potential potentiation. And what potentiation means, it's another good test question, potentiation means that the amount of hydrochloric acid that's secreted is greater than the sum of each of the individual parts. The amount of hydrochloric acid that is secreted is greater than the sum of each of the individual parts. So let me just kind of, that, that may not make sense yet, but hear me out. Acetylcholine by itself produces a certain amount of hydrochloric acid, just a little bit. Gastrin all by itself, if just gastrin is on board, it actually produces a little bit of hydrochloric acid. Histamine, again, just histamine all by itself will produce a little bit of hydrochloric acid. But when all three of these are on board, you actually secrete so much more, 10 times more hydrochloric acid than what, would you, than what you would do with each of the individual parts. So potentiation means that the hydrochloric acid secretion is greater than the sum of each of these individual parts. And that's all due to this paracrine signaling molecule histamine. So if you guys are just in Walgreens and you're, and you're looking uh, for acid secrete reduction medication, there's another one called Tagamet. Take a look at it, just going along Walgreens, you'll say, oh, Tagamet. Tagamet is a histamine blocker, but it works on this histamine receptor to reduce potentiation, to inhibit potentiation. So it helps to reduce acid. Yes? Yeah, this is a really good question. Antihistamines are a little bit different. So histamines are H1 receptors, but this tagamet is an H2 receptor. So they are both histamine receptors, but they are different subtypes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that's a really good question too. So a little bit of acetylcholine and gastrin are really going to affect the parietal cells only. It's not until you get into the gastric stage where it starts to spill over, I'll just say, onto the ECL cells, and then you get histamine release. So it's like ramping up the system. You actually have to get to a certain level of acetylcholine and gastrin release in order to get the, the last final histamine release which causes potentiation. Yep. Okay, so now it's easy to kind of go through this particular slide. Sight and smell, this is the cephalic phase. This is before you've eaten any food. You're already starting to get the parasympathetic neurons to release acetylcholine, which is producing a little bit of acid. 
and the G cells to start to produce gastrin. Eventually, gastrin and acetylcholine is going to start to trigger the ECL. This says F, but it should be ECL cells to secrete histamine, which then is going to secrete even more acid. G cells uh, also trigger the chief cells to produce pepsinogen, and then the acid converts pepsinogen to pepsin to start to break down proteins. So lots of types of secretions to help with digestion, saliva, acid, mucus. We'll talk about bile, bicarbonate, and digestive enzymes when we get to the intestinal phase on Wednesday. So this helps you guys think about it too. Here's the breakdown between the cephalic phase and the gastric phase. So the cephalic phase is only mediated by the vagal uh, efferents efferents, right? Because it's only a signal from the central nervous system to the stomach. So you're just smelling food. You're just thinking about food and you're already getting a little acid secretion and gastrin release. Then with the gastric phase, you have these mechanoreceptors that are detecting the stretch, sending a signal all the way to the central nervous system by the afferents and back through the efferents, efferents. That's ramping up the system. You're getting parietal cells to secrete more and more acid because of the gastrin release, the acetylcholine release, and the histamine release. Now, the difference between long and short reflexes is the long reflexes obviously go all the way to the central nervous system and back. Short reflexes, you can see this mechanoreceptor, just go in, within the stomach to other parasympathetic neurons that release acetylcholine. So these are short reflexes. You've got both long and short reflexes with the gastric phase. So this kind of helps you distinguish we're going to talk about the intestinal phase next time, but here are the three different phases. Cephalic phase, gastric phase, and then the intestinal phase. And if you need a few flow charts, it just kind of helps you think through all of this. Nothing, I've already talked about it. There's nothing really more to talk about. Long reflexes and short reflexes. How are we doing on time? Got about five more minutes. I'll just introduce the intestinal phase. All right, so we've got all this peristalsis going on, acid secretion, now histamine release, and even more acid secretion, potentiation occurs. And then, then only a small amount, little bit of food gets delivered into the duodenum, duodenum. Just a little bit of food enters into the small intestines and now everything slows down. It seems kind of counterintuitive. You would think that once a little bit of food entered into the small intestines that it would just dump everything into the stomach into the small intestines. But it doesn't do that. It actually just piecemeals it into the small intestines little by little. It helps with digestion and absorption. So what happens is that you have these sensors in the intestines, small intestines, in the duodenum. Okay, And it's sensing things like fats or lipids, acid, and an increase in osmolarity. And what it does is it signals the pacemaker cells to slow down decreases the intensity and frequency of the peristaltic, peristaltic contractions, and it increases the pyloric junction contractions. So it slows down what's called gastric emptying, right? You would think that it would just, like I said, increase gastric emptying. It would just dump the whole wad into the intestines, but it doesn't. It actually decreases gastric emptying slows everything down, 
piecemeals the food into the small intestines little by little. Okay. All right. So let's go through the anatomy of the small intestines, the duodenum. Okay. So here is the upper part of the small intestines. We'll talk more about the duodenum, the jejun jejunum, and ileum uh, next time. So those are the three different segments of the small intestines. We're just focusing this time on the upper part, the duodenum. And I want you guys to kind of see how the pancreas and the gallbladder are organized. They're very closely associated with each other. The gallbladder, as you guys know in lab, some people have had the lab and they have seen the gallbladder right underneath the liver. You can kind of lift up the liver and see that greenish little organ under there. And then the pancreas is a very glandular looking organ in a J loop within, it's kind of a closely associated with the small intestines. Now, the gallbladder is actually a storage for molecules called bile. So bile is a substance that's secreted by the liver and stored in the gallbladder. Helps with digestion. We'll talk about that next time. The pancreas is actually responsible for secreting bicarbonate to neutralize acid coming from the stomach and digestive enzymes like amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates, lipases, that break down fat, and proteinases, that start to break down proteins. That's all secreted by the pancreas. And you can see that there's a common hepatic duct, a common bile duct, and a pancreatic duct. They all kind of come together. This opening from the the gallbladder and the pancreas is called the sphincter of Odi. Seems odd, and that's not Odi. <laughs> Odi is a, an Italian scientist. Sphincter of Odi. And it delivers all of the, the bile and the pancreatic enzymes into the, the Duodenum. So digestive secretions from the liver and the pancreas are delivered into the duodenum, duodenum of the small intestines through the sphincter of Odi. Okay, okay guys, we will actually <laughs> we'll actually pick this up on Wednesday. I'll stick around for a little bit if you have any questions. Uh, yeah, let me let me stop this one because what we're going to do is we're going to go through the hormonal regulation and then I'll start to talk about digestion, absorption, and motility in the small intestines, large intestines, and separation. So we should be pretty close to being done after Wednesday's lecture. And will we be able to be done before Thursday or no? Uh, you know, I don't think we'll be able.